Our Father, again, we thank you for gathering us here together. And you are the great and glorious one. And we honor you in Christ's name. Amen. You may have a seat. It's a real privilege for us to have Val and Keith Brink with us here this morning. Paul's letter to the Colossians. It was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter Paul's letter to the to Colossians. Of people that Paul it was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for started. announcing Jesus this as the risen Colossae Lord. Was and the letter Paul's letter to the Colossians. Of people that Paul it was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter Paul's letter to the Colossians. We're doing overall. But he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address the issues that Epaphras had raised and then to challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. The letter's design and flow of thought are pretty easy to follow. The opening movement focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Paul then goes on to show how his suffering in prison is for the exalted Jesus. And then he addresses the pressures tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. After this, he explores the new way of life that Jesus' resurrection opened up for them. So the letter opens with two prayers. Paul first thanks God that he learned from Epaphras that the Colossians have been totally faithful to Jesus, showing love for God and their neighbors, all because of the hope they have in the new creation that Jesus has in store. And so he moves on to pray that they would grow in their wisdom and understanding about Jesus. And then Paul has placed a poem here to help the Colossians and us do exactly that. It's the centerpiece of chapter one, a poem all about the crucified and exalted Messiah. It has two parallel stanzas, and it's crammed with language and imagery from the books of Genesis and Exodus, from the Psalms and the Proverbs. The first stanza explores how Jesus is the true image of God. In him, the full character and purpose of God is embodied in a human. He's the firstborn, an Old Testament phrase about Jesus' royal status over all creation. He shares in the very identity of the one true creator God. And by him, all reality, all powers and authorities, spiritual and human, have been created. It's in Jesus the Messiah that we discover the very author and king of creation. And so in the second stanza, we discover he's also the one bringing about a new creation. He's the head of a new body, which refers to Jesus' people, who are the new humanity, of which his own resurrection existence is a prototype. In him, God's glorious temple presence dwells, and so it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that God has reconciled himself to humanity, to all spiritual powers, to all of creation. It's a remarkable poem, and Paul will keep referring back to it as he goes on in the letter. So he first shows how the truth of this poem transforms his own experience of suffering in prison. He's being punished for announcing to the Greek and the Roman world that Jesus is the resurrected Lord and King of all. And so his suffering, he thinks, is not a sign of defeat. It's actually his way of participating in Jesus' own suffering done as an act of love. And so his hardships are actually a cause for joy. He's imprisoned for the surprising news that Israel's resurrected Messiah is creating a new multi-ethnic family. And more, just as the divine glory dwelt in Jesus, so Jesus dwells in and among his international family. Or as Paul says, the Messiah is in you all, the hope of glory. Paul then addresses the cultural pressures that are tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. They were confronted by a combination of mystical polytheism along with a pressure to observe the laws of the Torah. So all these new Christians, they had grown up worshiping the various Greek and Roman gods who governed different arenas of human life. And many simply included Jesus as one more deity that they could worship. There was also great pressure from the Jewish Christian community for these non-Jews to complete their commitment to the Messiah by following all of the laws found in the Torah. Specifically, he mentions eating a kosher diet, observing sacred days, and circumcision. It's very similar to the problem he addressed in the letter to the Galatians. For Paul, to give in to either of these temptations is compromise. It's a failure to grasp who Jesus really is and what he did on their behalf. 
The Colossians used to live in fear of spiritual powers and elemental spirits, as Paul calls them. But Jesus triumphed over these. Through his death and resurrection, he freed the Colossians from any obligation to them. In the same way, Jesus fulfilled on our behalf all of the laws of the Torah, which never had the power to transform the selfish human heart anyway. And so what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection, it lacks nothing. It doesn't need to be supplemented by following the laws. He is the reality to which all of the laws of the Torah were pointing anyway. Instead of the laws, followers of Jesus have the power of his resurrection to change them, which is what he goes on to explore. Following Jesus means joining his new humanity because their lives have now been joined to the risen Jesus' life. And this is why Paul challenges the Colossians to set their minds on things above where the Messiah is seated or rules at God's right hand. Now Paul doesn't mean here, think about how you'll one day leave earth and go to heaven. Rather, the heavens are the transcendent place from which Jesus rules now over all of creation. And from there, he will one day return here to transform all things. Or as Paul says, when the Messiah who is your life is revealed, you too will be revealed with him in glory. So Paul challenges them to live in the present as the kinds of new humans they will one day become. He uses the image of their old humanity, characterized by distorted sexuality and destructive speech. For Christians, that humanity died with Jesus and has been replaced by his own new humanity, which is characterized by mercy and generosity, by forgiveness and love. And this humanity, it transcends the ethnic and social boundary lines of our world to create, in Paul's words, a people where there is no one Greek or Jewish, circumcised or uncircumcised, slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul then gets really practical and he shows the Colossians what this new humanity might look like in a first century Roman household, which was a highly authoritarian institution where the male patriarch held the power of life and death over his wife and children and slaves. Not so in a Christian household. Here, the risen Jesus is the true Lord. And so in the Lord, the wife allows her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is subject to Jesus by loving his wife and placing her well-being above his own. In a home where Jesus is Lord, children are not objects, but are called to maturity and to respect. And parents are to raise their children with patience and understanding. Christians who are slaves are to honor their human masters precisely because they're not the real master. Jesus is. And Christians who have slaves are to understand that this slave is not their property, but rather a fellow member of Jesus' body to be honored and embraced in love. And Paul's walking a very fine line here. He is reshaping the most basic Roman institution around Jesus who rules by his self-giving love. And so while he doesn't abolish the household structure outright, the exalted Messiah demands that it be transformed almost beyond the point of recognition for any Roman living in Colossae. You can see this most clearly in the letter's conclusion. After a request for prayer, Paul applies these instructions about Christian slaves and masters. And we discover that Tychicus is the one carrying and reading this letter to the Colossians. And he's accompanied by a certain Onesimus, who was a former slave to a Colossian Christian named Philemon. And we discover from another letter addressed to Philemon that Onesimus had escaped from his master. It was a crime worthy of imprisonment. But Paul asks the whole church to greet Onesimus as a faithful and beloved brother in the Lord. And then in the letter to Philemon, Paul says that he should receive Onesimus no longer as a slave, but as a brother. Talk about ending the letter with a punch. So in the letter to the Colossians, Paul is inviting us to see that no part of human existence remains untouched by the loving and liberating rule of the risen Jesus. Our suffering, our temptation to compromise, our moral character, the power dynamics in our homes, all of it must be re-examined and transformed. We are invited to live in the present as if the new creation really arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what the letter to the Colossians is all about.
song. We're going to let our kingdom kids uh, go downstairs. To do that, we need to not everybody go at once. So we're going to start with the smallest kids while we start to sing. So if you're in that uh, two and a half, is that it? Somebody help me. Yeah, two, two and a half. You start there and then uh, just watch and kind of go socially distanced. One parent, please take them downstairs. And I'll just remind you, there is an unsupervised nursery just off where the overflow is. If you need to uh, take your child out there for a little while during the service, either for feeding or for just helping them to settle a little bit, that's a room. There's also another room if you want a little more privacy for nursing. That's just off our offices. All right, so let's... Yes. Oh, no. Oh, okay. So let's stand together. And then remember, youngest kids first. Head out to the hall where Mrs. Crosby is and uh, Deanna. All right, Andrew, lead us in song.
are thankful, oh God, that we can worship your holy name because of the accomplished work of your Son, our Savior Jesus. And as we turn our attention to your word right now, we ask that you would be with us, asking this in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. It's a joy to have you with us today, and for those of you that have gathered with us online and out in the foyer here in the overflow, we're thankful that you are here. Uh, just one thing before we dive into God's word, uh, Derek has begun youth ministry uh, at the church, so that's been running now the last couple of weeks, and on Tuesday night, uh, we had 22 junior highs here. And so if you have a heart for youth, because part of running youth isn't just, uh, you know, the program. It's actually the investment in the lives of the youth. It's actually caring for them. It's loving on them in Jesus' name. It's walking alongside them and investing in them. And a whole group of those kids are coming from community homes that God is saving. And they're coming from our homes that God hasn't yet saved. And some of them are now, they know the Lord and they're wanting to grow in their faith. So we'd love you. If you'd be interested in investing with them on Tuesday nights or with the youth on Thursday nights, you can talk to Pastor Derek uh, after the service. We'd be happy to talk to you about what that looks like. But Investing in those young lives at this stage is uh, one of those pivotal ministries of a church as it allows us to really show them Christ and then direct them to him. If you have your Bibles, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and maybe one of the most technical sermons I've ever preached. Colossians 1, 15 to 20, the word of God says this, the son is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all of creation. For in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of the Lord. The most controversial aspect of our faith is the belief in a triune God. The fact that we believe that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And the fact that we believe that God as Father, Son, and Spirit has co-eternally existed from all of eternity. That is one of the anchor points of the Christian faith. And when it comes to the idea, the concept of who is Jesus, there's a great deal of controversy. If you do any reading of other religions, you can see it. Right? You want to read about the Muslim faith, they have an opinion about Jesus. About the Hindu faith, they have the, an opinion about Jesus. The Sikh faith, an opinion about Jesus. And I've talked to leaders, mainly in the Hamilton area, but beyond Hamilton, about what they believe about Jesus. You see it in cults, whether it be the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, the Christians, and in the cults' opinions of who Jesus is. In culture, because if Jesus is who he claims to be or who we believe he says he is or scripture claims him to be, it changes everything. Changes everything. But we believe he is the second person of the triune God and has eternally always been so. He's eternally always been the son. And so as Paul is writing here to the people in Colossae, and he's addressing the Colossian heresy is what's known as, which is a syncretistic heresy of both probably Jewish foundation, which is why you find some conversation later on in Colossians about Sabbath, uh, about circumcision that's mentioned. And then you have other that's mentioned, which would be probably Jewish pagan thought about principles and powers, possibly angelic worship of kinds. Paul is addressing that, and he starts by talking about who Christ is. The Bible, in the way it's written, over the ages and generations, multi-authored to us, does not have just a section you can look up on the Trinity. It's not like you can just open your Bibles to a certain portion of the Bible and say, oh, Trinity, and then read a portion on the Trinity. We piece 
portions of Scripture together to understand what God is saying. And all of those portions come together to grant, and grant us an understanding of who God is and how he has revealed himself to us. And so here in verse 15, Paul says, The Son is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all of creation. Now right there you have controversy. What does it mean when Scripture says he's firstborn? If he's always been. Why is that language used here? Why does Paul put that here? Firstborn typically means what? One who's given birth first. So why is that there? Looking for an answer. Oh wait, that's my job. All right. The son has eternally been the son, always. So we start with the son is in the image of the invisible God. He has always been the son. When we find Jesus at his baptism, the father says what? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. When we find uh, John describing the work of the father and the son, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He has, from eternity past, always been the son. It's not like there was a point where the father created the son. The son has always been the son. The spirit has always been the spirit. The father has always been the father. Always. And has always been so from eternity past. It's not like the son became the son when he incarnated himself. That's not what occurred. The son has always eternally been the son. Now, when you find the language here, the Son is in the image of the invisible God, we find that language in other places. In Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image. In our image. So you find this in other places in Scripture, this whole image idea. And I would suggest that Christ, having always eternally been the Son, means that though he is the second Adam, he was also the pre incarnate Adam, and as he was the pre-incarnate Adam, it means that when the Trinity is having this conversation about creating the Son in his image or likeness, he's being created in the image or likeness of the Son specifically, of the Son specifically. Though he will have attributes, Adam, of the Father and of the Spirit, but he's being imaged in that of the Son. And so you have the image of Adam who is created in the image of God. And Adam was to be this perfect representation of God in the sense that Adam was never to have sinned, but Adam chose to sin. And so from this pre-existing Adam, that's Christ, who becomes the second Adam when he incarnates himself, living perfectly, never sinning, we have the image of Adam made. You find Jesus showing up in Scripture as well prior to his incarnation. So in Scripture, you find these theophanies. That's what they're called. Sometimes Christophanies. Because we believe that Christ showed up at times prior to his incarnation. In the book of Genesis, in the 18th chapter, you find Abraham there. And in that conversation, it says, the Lord came to Abraham. The Lord came to Abraham. Well, who is the Lord? Who is this pre-incarnate figure? You find other examples of this in Scripture. Another one that's more popular, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're in the fiery furnace. The furnace has been heated seven times harder than normal. As they're in the furnace, and the furnace is heated to that seven times, finally, one of the, the, the administrators that's there says to King Nebuchadnezzar, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, live forever. Do we not throw three men into the fire? He says, we did. He said, there's a fourth man there, and the fourth man looks like the Son of God. That's probably a theophany. It's Christ in the furnace with them. They are in the furnace. And so you have, prior to his incarnation, Christ the Son, who is the image of the invisible God. Christ the Son, who is an image, who takes human form in the person of Christ, but does so even previous to that, images God at times in these theophanies or Christophanies in the Old Testament. God coming down. Some would suggest that any time you actually see the language the angel of the Lord used in Scripture in the Old Testament, it's always of a pre-incarnate occurrence of Christ. I would debate that at times. 
I think it's situation by situation you have to look at. But some would suggest it's any time that you see that. And so at times then, we find here the sun is, in language of scripture, is the image of the invisible God. He is then called the firstborn over all of creation. What does that mean? L.G. Tipton says this. Christ is eternally and originally the image of the invisible God. Christ is eternally and originally the image of the invisible God. That's what firstborn means. It means that he is originally God, and it means that he is eternally God. Because firstborn can hold to the meaning of this, the one who holds the inheritance right. The one who holds the inheritance right. The one who has the birthright. And so as the Father has chosen to use language to describe himself to us in ways that we can understand him as the Father, Christ as the Son, the Spirit as the Spirit, as that is true, firstborn language is used here, and that language is to depict Christ's supremacy. In saying he is firstborn over all of creation, he is saying he is preeminent over all of creation, and he owns the inheritance rights of the Father. And he is supreme. He is supreme. I'll come to that. I'll come back to that in a moment as we go through this passage. You find this reiterated a bit later in the very passage in verse 19, where Paul says, God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. And he's talking about the incarnated Christ at that moment. You'll see that in this passage, that there's a parallelism being drawn here that I'll get to, of the pre-incarnate Christ and the incarnate, then resurrected Christ. And the language is used very purposely, which is why some people think this was a hymn of some type. I don't think that. I don't think this, this shows the same characteristics of other hymns that are used in the New Testament but there's much debate over that. And I would suggest this. The, the reason that God is used here in terminology and not Father is I don't believe that Christ's incarnate nature was God the Father filling him with divinity. Christ's incarnate nature, nature was the divine Son being incarnated. And it was his divine nature, that is, the divine nature of the Son himself. Now, you feel like you're in seminary this morning. I know that. But why is this important? Everything about our faith hangs on this. Everything. This is critical to understanding our faith. That we believe in a triune God. Who has cloaked himself with the deity in the person of Jesus Christ. And has shown up. And has shown up. Jesus then is in very essence God. We find that in the book of Philippians. Pastor Paul looked at that last week. You find claims in Scripture where Jesus says what? I and the Father are one. So as we understand this from Scripture, John 1, what? The Word was with God. The Word was God. Right? The Word is both able to be with God and is God because God is triune in nature. So you have the very nature of Jesus who is in the image of the invisible God he is preeminent over all of creation. Now, why is that the case? Because of his power. Note this in verse 16. For in him all things were created. Paul here, in addressing the Colossian heresy, and the Colossians believing that there are other authorities, other powers that they should be praying to or talking to. I mean, I faced that this week. I was at a school meeting at St. Lawrence School. And they normally offer a prayer that I have found to be fine to open the school council meetings with. This week, we opened the prayer by praying to Mary. I'm like, here we go. This is it, right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we started this prayer into Mary that I don't pray with them. There are people all around us that believe there are other authorities, other powers to which you should address in prayer. The Colossians believe that. A whole group in Colossae believe that. And Paul, in addressing that and wanting specifically to talk about this, says, I want you to know there's no other power to talk to. There's no other being to go to. There's no other one to address. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. Anything in the heavens, anything on the earth, visible or invisible, anything you can see, anything you cannot see, thrones or powers. He's saying whether it's a human throne of someone who has authority or a power that you believe exists, whether it's a ruler, someone who is sitting in ruling authority, 
or it's just someone that has authoritative measure. All things have been created through him and for him. Paul's saying, I want you to know there's nothing in the universe, nothing whatsoever. He comprehensively lists through all of those statements that have not been created by Jesus. Everything, everything has been created by him. And he offers this comprehensive language so that everyone knows, including the Colossian believers, that there's nothing, nothing, nothing that is above the rule of Christ. Everything comes under his rule because not only is every created thing created through him, through his energy, through his creative being, through his power, it's created for him. It exists for him. Our prime minister exists for Christ. Our premier exists for Christ. Donald Trump exists for Christ. We exist for Christ. The angelic realm exists for Christ. The animals around us exist for Christ. The waters and the seas exist for Christ. The land and the mountains exist for Christ. They have been created by him and they are created for him. They exist for his glory and honor and purpose and pleasure for him. And Paul here in addressing that is showing his supremeness, his preeminence, if you will, that all things are owned by him. G.K. Beale, here we go. And so he, that's Jesus, is the perfect divine expression in eternity past of God's image. He is the archetype behind God's design for Adam to reflect God's image in an ethical manner and likewise for his people in the new creation to reflect God's image. Archetype meaning this. It is the pattern from which all copies are made. It is the original. Christ is the original. The archetype from which all things are made. But he becomes the ethical when he cloaks his deed with humanity. That is a representation of the copy or original. But he's a copy or a representation of himself as the second person of the triune God, cloaking his deity with humanity, coming down. Not taking upon the Father's deity when he comes down, but his own deity. He has his own deity. He has cloaked his own deity with humanity as he shows up. And he has a comprehensive power. He is eternally the Son. He is eternally the Son. That is who he is. And as you see that, you realize... P. Foster says this, that Christ constitutes both the domain and locus of power in which the cosmos can be brought into existence. The domain being the sphere. Christ is the sphere of power, but he is also the center of power. He is both. Some people debate whether it's one or the other, but it's actually both. He is the sphere of all power, and he is the centerpiece of power. That means there's nothing that is more powerful than Christ. He is the centerpiece of power, but he is the sphere of power, meaning that there's nothing outside of his power. All things exist within his power, within his control. That is who he is. That is our Christ. And then you find a reference again to firstborn in verse 18, that he is the firstborn from among the dead. I'll come back to that. Uh, sorry, that's verse 18. So then you have the authority of Christ, verse 18 of Colossians 1. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. And so now you have Jesus, who's not only created all things, but in verse 17, which is the bridge verse, holds all things together. Christ has the authority to hold everything together. Everything is held together by him. Now we transition to his incarnated self. He is the head of the body. He is the head. Head here meaning authority and also source. The great debate is whether head is simply authority or source. The answer is no, it's both. Authority, and you can see the authority here. When, when Paul is talking about his authority over principalities and powers, over visible and invisible, over, over that which is seen and unseen, it is authoritative. It is authoritative language. He is the head, the authority of the church. But he is also the source of our growth, which I believe is a secondary meaning of the term head. And so he is both the, the authority of the church, but he is also the, the source of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn. What does that mean? Well, we find this language in other places. He, he shows us what it means here from among the dead. 
In the book of Revelation, this is found in Revelation 1, verse 4 and 5. Grace and peace to you, John says, from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's our Christ. He is the firstborn among the dead. Christ conquered sin and death. And Christ being the firstborn from the dead is unique. Elijah, right, raised the widow's son to life, but the son would die again. Jesus raised a young girl to life, but she would die again. Jesus raised Lazarus to life, but Lazarus would die again. When Christ conquers sin and Satan and death on the cross, Christ is raised to life on the third day, having never sinned, because I've said this so many times, because sin could not accuse him. Because death could not destroy him. Because Satan could not own him or defeat him. Because that is true, on the third day he's raised to life again. He is the firstborn from the dead, never to die again. He died death once for all, never to die again. And when those of us who know him, those of us who believed on his name know him, die and were resurrected again, we will never die again. It is glorious good news. Our bodies won't decay. Last night, there was a picture of me from my induction service at my parents' house. My mom brought out this old picture of a friend and I. He had come to my induction, a non-Christian friend, and mom wanted to give him the picture. And so mom had this picture of me when I'm 23 years old, having just turned 23 and just become the pastor of this church and, I, and my induction service. And Amy looked at the picture, and I'm, I, I'm weighing 150 in that picture. That's what I weighed when we got married until I was about 30. And Amy said, because part of my sciatica is my weight. And so Amy said, 